Romans chapter 12. We covered verse 1 a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. We covered verse 2 last week. And today, we're going to get through the rest of the chapter. So, and I'm not just bragging because I actually did it in, second, in first service. So, we'll see, if we can, we'll see if we can make it here today as well. But this begins in uh, verse 3 for you and I, Romans 12, 3. Paul writes and says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, your Bible may say sound judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now stop there for just a moment if I could. Paul is going to be talking here in, in, in the, the next several verses about spiritual gifts and just gifts that God has given the body of Christ to function with. And so in order to kind of preface that uh, sort of a, a little study there for you and I, he begins by saying to us, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. I, I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, thing for him to say as he begins to preface this whole thing about spiritual gifts. And I kind of wondered why. I wondered why, why would you start off a talk about spiritual gifts with a statement saying essentially, don't think of yourself too highly, but think of yourself with sober judgment or sound judgment according to the faith that you've been given. And it dawned on me that a, a, a proper personal assessment of kind of who we are and what God has gifted us to do is, is really critical and, and very important when it comes to to being used by God. You see, if I, if I assess myself above what God has called me to do or to be in the body of Christ, then I'm always going to be overreaching. And, and I might be even looking for things, uh, expecting God to do things through me that he never ordained that would be accomplished through me. And, you know, by the same token, I, I think when, we, when Paul tells us to have a, a sound assessment of ourselves, he's telling us not to think too lowly of our calling or our gifting either because frankly too low of an assessment and I'm probably you know I'm not I'm, I'm probably not going to be expecting the Lord to do what he has in fact ordained to do and I my faith won't be reaching out uh, in a sense of having an expectation of God to to you know work through me when I think of a couple of biblical characters that kind of are an example to us on either side of the scale. I think of Peter. He's on the scale of probably thinking, uh, assessing himself a little too highly and had to be brought to a place of making a more sound assessment of his abilities, his gifting. And I think of somebody who probably thought too lowly of themselves, and I think of Gideon in the Old Testament, who, whom the Lord desired to use greatly to deliver his people from the Midianites, but Gideon had absolutely no expectation of the Lord using him at all and, and, and had to constantly go back and get a confirmation from the Lord that, in fact, this was, you know, his dealings. But so, you know, I think one of the things we need to ask the Lord in light of what Paul is saying in this verse here, in verse 3, is, you know, what have you given me faith to do? Because, again, he's going to talk about spiritual gifts in just a moment. He's going to talk about all the different things that the body of Christ is given to do, and he's going to mention all of them, but he's going to mention some of them. Some of the other gifts are mentioned in other uh, books of the New Testament. But whatever, you know, your gifting is, you need to be asking the question, Lord, do I, am I, am I functioning in this properly, you know? Or am I, am I overreaching beyond what you've called me to? Or am I not having an expectation of as good of a work as, in fact, you have um, given me to do what is what is you know am I am I serving in keeping uh, with my my calling you know a verse that we ought to hold on to when it comes to whatever the Lord has given us to do is a passage in Philippians let me show you this it, it says uh, Paul wrote this to the the church in Philippi he said I can do all things through him who strengthens me now I I sometimes hear this verse being quoted by people as if it's a it's kind of like your Superman verse. In the sense that, you know, you know, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound sort of a thing. I can do all things through Christ. Listen, 
You are who God has made you to be. You are gifted who, who, according to the giftings that God has given to you. And within the context of the gifting and the calling that the Lord has placed upon your life, there is nothing that you can't do in Christ Jesus. But this verse isn't necessarily a promise that you're going to be a super apostle or you're going to be just like somebody else <laughs> who you might really admire or, or, or whatever the case might be. I don't know if you've ever run into our Calvary Chapel magazine that we make available in the uh, entryway from time to time. This is the latest one that came out. It's winter 2015, so... Anyway, it's a, it's a magazine. It's good, probably good. You know, if you see one of these, you don't charge anything for them. Just grab it and read it. And it kind of is a, it tells about what a lot of Calvary chapels are doing around the world. And I grab this from time to time and I read it, but I, I find that I have to be careful when I'm reading it. Because a lot of these guys that they're talking about in here, I know, either personally or through email or, or something like that. And I'll kind of be reading in, in an article and kind of go, oh yeah, I know that guy. And Wow, he's doing stuff in East Africa right now. And then I go over and read this other thing about, you know, this pastor who's planting churches, you know, in um, some other country or whatever. And I, I can get done reading this magazine and I can put it down and I can think, God, I don't even think you're using me. Because we compare ourselves with other people and the gifting and the calling that God has placed upon their life, and we're not looking at ourselves with sound judgment according to the faith or according to the calling that's on our personal lives. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I've been, I was called to Ontario, Oregon to start a church 25 years ago and to teach God's Word. And, you know, for the most part, I'm pretty happy with that. And I'm pretty satisfied with that calling. But all i got to do is leaf through a few pages of this magazine and I can start to doubt that I may be doing all that I should be doing. But then when I really kind of assess myself soberly with sound judgment, I go, you know what, though? I don't have the faith to do what these guys are doing. I don't have the grace. They do. And they've got this just, you know, and, and I have to kind of come back and say, it's okay. It's okay to be whoever God has called you to be and, and, and to just to view yourself according to the faith that God has given. And that is what Paul is telling us, you know, to do uh, in, in this passage. This is the exhortation. Assess yourself accordingly to the faith, to the calling that God has given to you. And he's going to go on here now, and he's going to talk about the body of Christ and the giftings that we have received, and he's going to exhort us to use those giftings, all right? So here's what he says. He goes on in verse 4. And he says, For as in one body we have many members, and he's talking about your physical bodies, as in your physical body you have a lot of different parts to the body. He says, And the members do not all have the same function. Aren't we glad about that? He says, So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of another. Or as the NIV says, each member belongs to all the others. And then verse 6 is the key. Look at this. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. Now stop there for a moment because he's going to go through and talk about some of those giftings in a moment. But I want to look at exactly what he has said to you and I up to this point. Having gifts that differ, let us use them. See, it's okay to look at somebody else and their gifting and say, that's different from the gifting that God has given me. And that's all right. Because just as in the physical body, I don't expect all of my parts to be the same, and they have a very different function. You know, my feet work really well getting me from point A to point B. But once I get to where I'm going, I usually employ one of the other parts of my body. It could be my hands, could be my mouth if I'm teaching the Word or something. I'm really glad that my feet aren't responsible for teaching the Word of God because they wouldn't do a very good job of it. Different parts have a different function, and that's what Paul is saying to you and I. That's okay. It's okay for us to be different. Let's just do <laughs> what we've been called to do. 
Let's just be involved and, and let's, let's get busy. So he says here again in verse 6, let's read it again because we're going to go on and finish reading that verse so we can see it in context. Verse 6 says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And then he talks about if prophecy in proportion to our faith. Paul says if you have a prophetic gifting, then use it in proportion to your faith, in proportion to the calling that God has given to you. Now, there are some people that don't even believe that you can have a prophetic gifting today. And I respect their opinion, but I respectfully disagree. Why not? Some people will say, well, there's no need for prophecy today because the Bible's been written and it's completed, it's done, and we don't need that sort of an element of the gifting of the Spirit any longer. Why not? I, I, you guys know how I feel about the Word of God. I teach through the Bible. And I, I'm, I agree. The Bible's done. It's written. It's finished. The, that revelation is done. So does that mean God can't talk anymore? Does that mean he's got nothing else to say? You know, this morning, Sue got up and just felt led of the Lord to share a, a scripture and an exhortational prayer with you. Do you understand that that is the essence of prophecy? People think that prophecy is foretelling some future event. You know, in the Bible, we do see a lot of that, but it's also just foretelling. It's just speaking. It's just God speaking to people. It's, it's all it is. It's very simply. It's very simply God moving upon the heart of one of his children and to say, hey, I got a message for that person right over there. Would you do that? Would you just go give that to that person right over there? And they walk over to that person and say, hey, I think God has a message for you. I just really feel like he's laid it on my heart. Really, what is it? Could be something as simple as, God just wants you to know this. He loves you. Do you guys understand that that is the essence of prophecy? <laughs> It, 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 you know, it's not this big, thus saith the Lord. You need, I need to put echo on there to really make it sound good, you know. You know, thou shalt, you know, and one week hence, this shall. You know, that is an element of prophecy, again, that we see in the Word. And God is wonderful at knowing the end from the beginning and being able to speak of things as if they've already happened. But don't limit prophecy to that element and that aspect. It is as simple as being led to say to someone, God has a message for you. And I just, I've been praying, and as we were worshiping here today, God has a message. You know, in, in, in the book of Acts, we see that the believers got together up in Antioch, and they're worshiping the Lord, and they're fasting, and they're praying, and God moved upon somebody with a prophetic gifting to go over to Paul and Barnabas and say, hey, set apart Paul and Barnabas for the ministry to which they've been called. And they laid hands on them and they prayed for them and they sent them off and thus began the, the missionary journeys that, that we have written in the book of Acts. But it started with a prophetic word, somebody just simply saying, I have a message from God and I want to speak it out. Now, does that mean people can't abuse the gift of prophecy? Well, of course not. Of course, and they have and, and they do. But you know what? People abuse everything. So are we going to shut the whole shooting match down because it gets abused? Here's what we're supposed to do, people. We're supposed to test everything by the Word of God. It's supposed to measure up to the Word of God. I mean, if somebody comes off half-cocked and they, thus saith the Lord, and they give you some really dopey statement, you know, it's like, you know what, I'm going to test that by the Word. Frankly, I've had people say things to me claiming to give me a prophetic message that, I, that never came to pass and I knew wasn't the Lord when they said it. I just, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a witness in my spirit, and I was just kind of like, hey, thanks a bunch. I'll take that to the Lord. And 30 years went by, and it never came to pass. But that's okay. Hey, they tried and they failed, you know. But that doesn't mean the gifting isn't genuine. So Paul says, if you have that gifting, that gifting of prophecy, then use it. And do it in proportion to your faith. Verse 7, he goes on to speak of service. He says, if service, then in our serving. You know, do it in proportion again to your faith. By the way, the word that he uses here for service is, uh, or serving is the word that we translate deacon elsewhere in the Bible. So you guys understand what a deacon is? It, by the way, a deacon was never someone who ran the church ever in the Bible. We've done that in church history. 
You know, we have like deacon boards and the deacons kind of rule. Deacons are servants. They put on aprons. They grab a broom. They walk around with a plunger. And they help deliver meals to people. That's a deacon. Deacon means servant. Okay? So it's a really simple sort of a terminology, but he's simply saying, if you're gifted to serve, then serve. Do you know how fun it is to serve? I, some of my best memories are just serving in the church before I started teaching the Word or got recognized, you know, for anything else that God had for me to do. Oh, I loved those early days of, of just serving. When Sue and I, when God put our marriage back together and we started going to church and we were excited about just living for Jesus, and I was working in radio at the time. Most of you know that. I was a disc jockey and so they assumed because I was a disc jockey, I knew all about sound systems. So they made me run the sound system. And, and so, you know, I didn't necessarily feel like that was particularly my calling, but I loved it. I loved getting there early and getting things set up and getting the music going in the room and, and, and just so there's a worshipful attitude in, in, in the room as people came in. And, and, and I just loved helping, you know, whatever, whatever there was to do, whether it was just go around and check the, the garbage cans and make sure they're empty and make sure the place is clean and, hey, there's a little place over there we need to vacuum and let's be sure that's all cleaned up. And we want to just get this place ready for people when they get here so that they know that they're cared for and they're loved. And, and, and you know, we've, we've got guys who get here uh, before you do we have ushers, we have greeters, we have building hosts. They're servants. And they come and they get the place ready for you. And, and I, I assume that they're delighted to do it because they just keep doing it. And they, 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 they meet you at the door with a smile and they shake your hand. And, and they're just, they're serving, you know? So Paul says if your gift is that of service, then serve. Do it. Don't sit back and, and, and hold back. But be involved in what you're supposed to be doing. He, he goes on at the end of verse 7. He says, the one who teaches in his teaching, you know, do it also in proportion to his faith. A teacher, by the way, a teacher and preacher, they're different things. People mix them up from time to time. Paul doesn't even mention preaching. He will mention exhortation in a moment, which is largely what a preacher does. But a teacher is someone who has been gifted to explain the Word of God and to apply it and to help the people listening to apply the Word of God to their lives. In fact, verse 80 goes on to talk about, really, what is the essence of preaching. And that's in verse 80. He says, the one who exhorts in his exhortation. Again, he's saying, let it be done according to their faith. An exhortation is, um, if you have an NIV on your lap there, it, your, your Bible says encouragement or encouraging. Uh, one who encourages. And that's the essence of what it means to exhort. To preach is to encourage. I always think of preachers as like, it's kind of that locker room talk that the coach gives before you go out and play the game. And that coach is, you know, he's, he's, he's reminding you of the things that you've learned. Here's the things you guys learned. Now I want you to do this. And we're going to go out there and we're going to do this and we're going we're gonna to win this thing. And because Jesus is on our side. And that's that exhortational gift, you know. And maybe you have that gift. Maybe you have the, uh, the desire, the gifting to go to people and just go, hey, let's do this thing, you know? You can do this. Jesus is <clears throat> in your life, and he will, he will make you able, and you can do it, you know? I, I worked with a guy years ago up in Washington who was an encourager. He just had the gift, and, and he could look just, he, you could be just depressed, you know, and, and, and ready to Throw in the towel. And this guy had the gifting from the Lord to give you hope through his encouragement. And so people would flock to our church just to hear him give encouragements to people. It was, it was a wonderful gift. He wasn't real strong on teaching the Word, but, but he was an encourager, you know? And I, I just, I really grew to appreciate that because I, I feel like I'm not so much that. Um, he goes on here in verse 8 to speak of one who contributes to do it in generosity. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever thought about the gift of being able to give? We don't think about that so much, do we? The gift of generosity or the gift of contributing. 
Wow. He says, the one who leads to do it with zeal. Zeal means energy, passion. If you're called to be a leader. You guys understand that there's leaders and then there's, we call them trench people, the, the, the folks who are being led. If you think of it as people digging trenches, I don't know why that is the picture that we've come up with over the years, but it just is. And when Sue and I are talking about people, we talk about whether they're trench workers or whether they're people who stand up above the trench and point where to go, because that's what a leader does. And it could be a leader of a particular ministry or a leader of, of servants or whatever it may be, but you got people who just love getting down in the trench. They got their shovel, and they just want to, they're just like, tell me where to go. And they'll just boom, dig. And, they're, and they don't need to kind of look up and see where we're heading. They got a leader to do that for them. They're just, and the leader's going, yeah, dig a little bit lower to the left. All right, you got it, sir. Boom, boom, boom. And, and the leader's kind of standing up there above everybody, kind of going, all right, that's far enough. Now we're going to go this way. And they're like, yeah. You know what I mean? It's really cool. But that's what a leader does. A leader leads. Isn't that deep? So, you know, but he says, he says if, if, you're, if you're called to do that, then do it with passion. Do it with zeal. He says, uh, the one who does acts of mercy, do it with cheerfulness. Be cheerful about it. You know why he says that? Because oftentimes when you're doing an act of mercy, it's a sacrifice. Being merciful to people is often a sacrificial act because many times they're very needy, very needy, and it takes a real expenditure of your life to extend yourself to them. You know, I was reading about a Christian woman who was kind of giving a testimony about her own acts of mercy toward her mother. Her mother, uh, when she became old, needed someone to care for her, and she, the woman said that uh, we invited... She said, we invited my mother to come and stay with my husband and I. And um, so this woman began to basically do everything, you know, to take care of her mother, um, you know, cooking for her and cleaning, doing the washing, taking her around in the car, generally caring for all of her needs. But she went on to kind of, as she gave this testimony, she said that while I was going through all of the motions outwardly, I found that uh, inwardly I was unhappy and I, because I resented uh, the interruption in my, my life. You know, my mother just kind of got old and needed help, and, and I was busy and enjoyed my life, but now I had to kind of put everything on hold in order to minister, you know, to my mother. And, and finally, her mother came up to her, and she said, she said, you never smile anymore. Why don't you smile? And it got her to thinking about what she had been doing. She had been involved in showing mercy to her mother, but she wasn't doing it with cheerfulness because, again, there was that sacrifice that went along with it. And, and, that's, and Paul understood that. You know, when you're extending yourself to someone in mercy, many times it's, it's going to mean that, you know, you're going to have to give up something. And so he said, uh, do it with an attitude of cheerfulness. The bottom line is that whatever you're called to do, Whatever God has gifted you to do, do it. Like Nike says, just do it, you know. Um, be involved. Be working. Be, be active in, in, in what you're called to do and what God has gifted you to do. I'm, I, I'm, this, is a, this is a total guess on my part, okay? So you can take it as such. But... If I had to guess how many Christians in the body of Christ even knew what they were called to do, I'd have to say it was extremely small, somewhere around 10 to 15%. Christians actually know what they're called to do. You know, I think we need to get busy. I think we need to realize there's not one single... One single person. There is not one person whom God has left out of the equation of his gifting and calling. I don't think anybody has been left out. I think there should be 100% participation because there's 100% gifting. Now, again, like we've said here throughout the course of these verses, you can't sit and look at somebody else's gift. You can't compare yourself what somebody else is necessarily doing. 
You gotta, you gotta do what God's called you to do. What is your passion? What are you seeing in front of you? What are your hands finding to do? Get busy, you know? Serve the Lord. He's coming back. And let me tell you, you're gonna thank me someday <laughs> if the Lord comes back and you got busy because of this exhortation. You want the Lord to find you doing when he comes back, right? Not sitting and waiting. Well, I was just waiting because God hasn't told me yet. You know, you don't want to do that. If, if you're not sure where your calling is, just get busy doing something. You know, we put up things every week that people can get busy and do that we need help with. And sometimes we put out the word for people to get busy and nobody says anything. You know, I put out a note this last week asking just for somebody to put up our Christmas tree in the entryway for the angel tree coming up, you know, which we're going to start on the first Sunday of December. I didn't get any responses. I was just looking for a family to maybe do it as their project. Nobody said anything. It's, just, it's a small thing. It's just a ministry of helps. But we want people to get involved. And I know, I know you're busy. But you've got to ask yourself the question, what are you busy with? <laughs> you know, and I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on anybody. I'm just saying that sometimes we kind of get our perspectives. We're so focused on things that just aren't going to matter in the grand scheme of things. And we're leaving the work of the Lord for somebody else to do. You guys do know that in any given Christian church, about 10% of the people do 100% of the work. And that's just that's a fact of the matter. It's an unfortunate fact. Because our bodies are made up so beautifully, physically speaking, in the sense that we have all these different things that function, and we're really glad that they function, but in the body of Christ, we have a lot of parts of the body that don't ever do anything. They're not really doing anything, but you're a part nonetheless. So Paul is giving these exhortations to be involved but do it in proportion to the faith that God has given you. Look at verse 9 and following. He says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Does that sound like three different exhortations to you? I think they're all part of the same one. The first one is the main one. Let love be genuine. It, it, what it means, by the way, it's where genuine is where we get our word uh, hypocritical. Um, and, and he's literally saying, don't let your love be hypocritical. But then he says two other things that show your genuine love. And one of them is, abhor what is evil. That's hard to do in the world that we live in today, isn't it? Because we feel like we're just abhorring everything. Because the world is so incredibly dark. But you know, one of the ways that we show our love for other people, people that we love who are maybe involved in sinful activity, is by abhorring what is evil and not acting like what they're involved in related to sin doesn't matter. You know, you're not doing anybody any favors by looking at their sinful lifestyle and just winking at it and acting like there's no problem with it. That doesn't do them any favors at all. And people struggle with this because they feel like in order to say something to someone, it's going to, it's going to come off very unloving. How can I do this? I love this person. Of course you love that person. That's why you have to say, that's wrong. I love you, and I will never stop loving you, but that's wrong. Don't do that. Why, why are we told to abhor evil? Because it hurts people. It hurts people, you guys. It's not. We're not just saying it because, you know, we're trying to throw another rule in their path. Here's another rule for you. Here, trip over that one. No, it's, it's bad for you. You know, when my kids were small, if, they, if I saw them putting something in their mouth that was bad, I ran over to them and I took it out because I loved them. Can you imagine if I said, oh, I love you. Go ahead and eat that thing. That'd be pretty stupid, wouldn't it? And I wouldn't be a very good dad if I'd have done that. But, oh, we have this mentality today in our culture, if you tell me that what I'm doing is wrong, you're telling me you don't love me. That's the dumbest thing 
anybody ever came up with. Sometimes we have to just be strong and abhor evil. So you know what? That's wrong. And call it what it is. That's wrong. And that's going to hurt you. And I love you. And that's why I'm telling you this. And then we're told, Paul tells us to hold fast to what is good. Boy, it's getting that it's harder to hold on, isn't it? Sometimes. But verse 10, he says, love one another with brotherly affection. In fact, he says, outdo one another in showing honor. Brotherly affection. You know, in the Greek, that word brotherly is Philadelphia. Yeah, same word. That's literally where the word comes from. Philadelphia, as you know, is the city of brotherly love. So they say. But that's where the idea comes from. What Paul is saying here is love one another in a loving family sort of a way. You know, brotherly affection. That took a little while to take hold with me because when I was growing up, <clears throat> I had a, had a, have a brother uh, still to this day. He's two years older than me. But while we were growing up, he pretty much pounded me every chance he got. And um, I think he kind of thought it was fun. And I'm sure for him it was. But so, you know, as I was growing up, brotherly affection didn't mean a whole lot. You know what I mean? If somebody said, you need to have brotherly affection, I probably would have gone around punching people. Because that, but now, you know, I'm older now, he's older, and you know, he, he and I have a very good and very close relationship. But what Paul is talking about here is loving people with that attitude of family, you know? Really love one another like you really truly are part of the family of Christ. In fact, try to outdo. Try to outdo blessing and honoring one another. He says in verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal. Now, there's some terms we probably don't use. The NIV says, don't be lacking in zeal. Don't let your zeal slow down. In other words, your passion. But he says, rather, be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. You know, this is a great verse, unless you're lacking in zeal when you hear it. You, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like looking at somebody who's like lying on the ground bleeding and walking up to him and going, don't bleed. You know, it's like, wait a minute, they're already bleeding. What do you get? You got to do something now. Sometimes we get a, we see a verse like this in the Bible. It says, don't be lacking in your passion and zeal for the Lord. And you read it and you go, I am lacking in my passion and zeal for the Lord. There's no question about that. I just, I'm not, I'm not on fire like I used to be. So now what are you going to do? Now you confess it to God. I mean, that's all I know to do. You take it to the cross, right? Do you think in 30-some-plus years of ministry I've ever been lacking in zeal? <laughs> Kidding. Try maybe dozens of times. I mean, life just kind of piles up on you, doesn't it, sometimes? And you have to go to the Lord and say, God, I, just, I, I need to ask you to forgive me because I, I need to confess that the fire is just real low. My zeal, my passion, my desire to serve you is just kind of ebbing right now, and I need to confess it. And uh, Lord, I'm gonna, I want to ask you. I want to ask you to reignite that flame in my heart. Do you remember those times when you used to be so excited about Jesus? You used to go and fill up your car at the gas station and give the guy who pumped your gas a Bible. Or, or you know, you stood in line for something, and you, if you started a conversation with anybody, Jesus always came up in the conversation. Do you remember those days? Those can happen again. But we get to just kind of lack. We just fade a bit in our passion for the things of the Lord. We just get busy and distracted, and, and pretty soon we find ourselves in a situation where <gasps> I'm just not living for him like I used to. I want to get back there, don't you? just want us like, Jesus, just light the flame again, please, and let it burn hot in my heart. I want to live for you. You know, when you come back, I don't want to be sitting around, you know, going through the channels, you know. I want to be serving the Lord. So we're not to lose our enthusiasm. Chapter, or verse 12, he says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation or hardship or challenge, be constant in prayer. You know why you and I can rejoice in hope? Because our hope is in Christ. And nobody's taken that away. Nobody can take that away from us. And that's why we can rejoice even when we're going through a time of tribulation. See, that lends itself to patience. When we're going through a difficult time, we have this patience. 
that comes into the, into the equation because our hope is in Christ. And that leads itself to a greater prayer posture in our lives. It moves us to pray when we might otherwise be tempted to despair. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints. And by the way, saints there refers just to believers. I don't know if you knew that or not. If you're in Christ today, you are a saint. Okay? Don't go around and start calling yourself saint, whatever your name is, because that probably won't fit too well with folks. But you are a saint. The Bible says you're a saint, and it doesn't mean you're saintly. Okay? Wouldn't that be cool if one of you was named Nick? That'd be kind of fun. But, you know, again, it, it doesn't mean that you're saintly. It just means saint means one who is set apart for God. So, but notice what Paul is saying here. Contribute to the needs of the saints and show hospitality. Take care. And this is another way of saying take care of people who are in the family of God. Take care of those people and situations. Um. It can be challenging, though, can't it, to know who to help sometimes, you know? It's a very, very difficult time in which to live because we don't know if, sometimes if people are genuinely in need, and we, we struggle with that. And the early church struggled with that as well. But nonetheless, Paul exhorts us to show hospitality. Look at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. When's the last time you had somebody curse you? Um, can I just say that blessing somebody when they curse you does not come naturally? I mean, if somebody gets like that far from your nose and you can like, they're spitting on you while they're talking and they're saying the most horrible, rotten things to you and literally just cursing and, you know, that sort of thing, it is not a natural response for you and I to say, bless you. Is it? It's to say what they're saying back at you, right? That's what comes naturally. But naturally refers to the natural man. You and I aren't called to respond based out of the natural man. We're told to respond out of the supernatural man. That's why when we're yielding to the Spirit, we can respond to a cursing with a blessing. And that just messes with people's minds. They don't know what to do. When somebody's like just screaming at you and frothing at the mouth and just, you, and you come back and you just bless them. You say, yeah, yeah. Can I pray for you? Pray God's blessing on your life? What? Because, you know, they're in fighting mode. And if you decide, I'm not going to do that. You know, the book of Proverbs says a gentle answer turns away wrath. You ought to try it sometime. It's amazing. It is really amazing. <laughs> Sue and I had this happen not that long ago. We have, we have a neighbor who uh, owns a piece of property near us, and, and um, he thought that we were dumping on somebody's land we weren't I was I was brushing out just some debris out of the back of my pickup like dust I just didn't want to get it on my driveway and so we just pulled over to this empty field there was nothing there and we were just kind of brushing out you know dirt and stuff like that putting it on dirt <laughs> and this guy our neighbor he was just he came scooting over on his four wheel and he was just don't you're not supposed to be dumping on people's land and we just, started, we just started talking really gently to him right away. And he was like, hmm. He didn't know what to do. He just, you know, he was completely just set off. And Sue started saying, by the way, your land over here, you're doing just a beautiful job with it. It looks gorgeous. He was kind of like, you know? It was really something. Uh, it's, it's crazy to watch some of those Bible verses come to life when you put them into practice, you know. I personally wanted to deck him, but, <laughs> but Sue was talking nice, so I thought, oh, yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. 
Um, 15, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. You know why that's hard? We don't like to rejoice with people who are rejoicing because we're usually jealous. We're jealous that they've got something to rejoice about, and we look at them and we go, how come God isn't doing that for me? And then he says, weep with those who weep. That's sometimes a challenge thing too, unless you have a gift of compassion, but a lot of times we don't. We avoid people who are weeping. We see somebody crying. We look the other way. They're crying. You know? But Paul tells us to be involved, to enter into their joy or their sorrow. Cry with them. You know, I've, I've heard some of the most powerful testimonies of people ministering to other people by not saying a single word. I, I, I've heard just powerful, powerful testimonies of somebody who's just broken and weeping, and somebody else comes along, and they sit down with them, and they cry with them. And that person, that first person comes back later and says, that was the most healing thing that could have happened in my life. They sat there and they just shared my pain and carried it with me, just cried. The last several verses all kind of go together, so I'm going to do them together. Paul says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. That means prideful. But associate with the lowly. That means people who might not have the things that you have. Never be wise in your own sight. There's a toughie. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. By the way, that verse right there answers the question about what to do if you want to live peaceably with someone, but they don't want to live peaceably with you. Because that happens, doesn't it? You don't have any beef or any problem, but they just don't like you. And they've determined they're not going to live peaceably with you. So what do you do? Paul says, as far as it's in your power, make sure that it happens on your end of the equation. In other words, you're not the one stoking their flame, but you're the one who is doing your best to pray for them, speak kindly to them, and potentially even resolve whatever issues there may be. So insofar as it depends on you, Live at peace with all people. Verse 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. That's a hard one too. You know why? We want people to hurt like they hurt us, don't we? We like, we, you know, it's kind of, there's something in us that wants people to hurt the way they hurt us. You, you see it in movies and stuff all the time, you know. I want him to hurt. I want him to feel what I felt. And you know, what they're doing, they're expressing that base human reaction. We might not verbalize it like they do in the movies, but it's there. You know, we want people to experience some level of pain because we think it's fair. Don't you think that'd be fair, God? To hurt them. Hurt them for me. No. Paul says, no. Do not avenge yourself. Leave it to the wrath of God. He's much better at it, by the way. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No retaliation in the body of Christ. Verse 20, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. What in the world is that talking about? It's talking about causing somebody in the midst of their bitterness and anger to feel shame. It's that burning shame of knowing that they responded negatively and bitterly and angrily to you, and you came back with kindness. You came back with blessing. You came back with encouragement, and they're ashamed by what they've done. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What does that mean? It basically means that if if someone's hatred or bitterness causes you to hate them back, you've now been overcome by evil. Paul says don't let that happen. Overcome evil with good. If somebody hates you, if somebody's bitter against you, if they're saying nasty things about you, you say good things. You speak words of blessing. You speak words of honor. Don't talk behind their back. 
And do not allow their bitterness to poison you so that you feel the same toward them. Because again, if you do that, you're being overcome by evil. You are to overcome evil with good. You say, well, Pastor Paul, how in the world am I going to do that? Hey, don't ever forget. We serve that, you know that one guy who was like up on the cross? And he hung there. And the first thing he said was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You know that guy? You've heard of him, right? He lives in your heart by faith. And his power and his ability to say that on the cross is now living in you. You have that ability to say that. You can look square in the face of those who are tormenting you. You can say, Father, I pray a blessing upon their life. And I mean a blessing. I pray that you would bless this person. Bless their socks off. Listen, that doesn't come from the flesh, you guys. That comes from the Spirit. 